So just a quick recap of what we have looked at in this course so far. So, so now everyone knows what convex functions are. So we have looked at convex functions, we have looked at variants of convex functions, namely strongly convex is something that we looked at in uh, rather extensively. The reason being you can accelerate the optimization of such uh, strongly convex functions. For a general convex function, uh, you may not be able to uh, accelerate the convergence. The other thing uh, is strong, a strongly convex, convex function also a strictly convex function? Yes, right. And we know it has a unique minimizer. So, unlike with convex functions, while it is fine that you, I mean, whatever minima you arrive, it is going to be the global minima as well. With strongly convex functions, there is going to be just one global minima. So, and we looked at another, I mean, we kind of briefly touched upon something called L smooth function. Does anyone remember what L smooth function is? So, the gradient is Lipschitz, right? So, just to uh, recap what else smooth functions are. So, else smooth functions, so if I consider the gradient of this function, so gradient has this Lipschitz property. So, another way to say this is uh, Hessian of f that is going to be upper bounded by L times identity, ok. That is your L smooth function. And we know that if it if the function is strongly convex, then it is lower bounded by mu times identity, ok. So, this is when when f is mu strongly convex. So, what does this tell you? So, if the function is both strong mu strongly convex and L smooth, what does this tell you? Yeah, so from here you can conclude that L is always greater than or equal to mu, ok. Or rather mu or L for a strongly convex function which is a L smooth as well. So, this number is always going to be uh, smaller than or equal to 1, ok. So, this is one thing that we are going to look at uh, when we derive uh, convergence rate for different types of algorithms, alright. So, we have looked at, uh, so far we have looked at convex functions, uh, certain variants of convex functions, as I said strongly convex functions, strictly convex functions and so on. In the last class in particular, we also looked at Slater's condition and how it sort of relates to strong duality. And basically, we looked at the dual formulation of uh, primal optimization problems, right. So, ok, alright. So, does everyone know what gradient descent algorithm, how it works? So, we simply so, if I look at something like gradient descent, it simply has this kind of update, right? xk plus 1 is xk minus step size times gradient of f evaluated at xk. Now, how do you choo choose this particular step size? Anyone who has worked uh, with optimization algorithm? Oh. Hessian as in? Yeah, yeah. So, if Hessian inverse rather than if you, if you, but that is for Newton's method, right? For simple gradient descent which does not use second order information. Let us say we are looking at simple gradient descent. You can do line search. So, let us say, let us add a little bit uh, more information about this function. So, let us say the function is L smooth. Can we say something about and let us also assume that we know the value of L. I mean, we, we need not know the optimal solution, but we sh we may know the fun uh, value of L, right. So, does this give us some way to come up with an optimal learning rate? So, the answer will to some sense, to, in some sense the answer is yes. And today, uh, I mean the focus for today's class is going to be analyzing the uh, naive sort of gradient descent algorithm. And we sh will show that for L smooth functions which are convex, need not be strongly convex, for L smooth functions which are convex. 
a good choice of the learning rate would be 1 over L and we are going to be deriving that today. Okay, so this is a suitable choice of learning angle, learning rate. Yeah, so we are going to look at that criteria, uh, how we basically come up with 1 over L. And first of all, I mean, to start with, would it even converge, right? Like, let's say uh, if I consider a problem of this form, let's say I'm trying to minimize x square, right? Okay, so I I have xk here, xk here, and then I I want to arrive at an xk plus 1 which will improve the function value, right? So, what is the gradient for let's say f of x is half x square, okay? What is the gradient of, gradient of f? x, right? So, if I look at the, for just for this specific problem, if I look at xk minus eta times gradient of f of xk, which is also going to be xk, this is 1 minus eta times xk, right? Okay. If I choose eta to be more than 1, let us say I choose eta to be 2, or learning a rate of 2, what happens? It just keeps oscillating between plus x minus x plus x minus, like basically whatever, let us say you start with x not equal to 2, it will keep oscillating between 2 and minus 2, right? So, it does not even converge. If I choose eta to be more than 2, it diverges, right? So, what would happen is, this is for eta more than 2, it will just keep on uh, like basically diverging eventually. So, the choice of learning rate matters, right? As you can see, when you are talking about discrete, discretized implementation or discrete time algorithms, the choice of learning rate matters. So, eta less than 1, we know that it sort of slowly converges, right? So, eta less than 1, uh, it is convergent. And of course, you are going to assume that the learning rate is positive, uh, that is that is a lower bound in learning rate anyway. But eta less than 1, it is going to be converging because the new value of xk is plus 1 or new value of x is going to be uh, smaller like basically something lesser than xk, right? So, it is going to be converging. Eta equal to 1, what happens? It instantly arrives at the optimal solution, right, in one step, right? If eta equal to 1, in one step you arrive at the optimal solution and eta greater than 1, in fact greater than 2, it starts diverging, right? Greater than 2, it diverges. So, the choice of learning rate plays a key role and uh, if let us say, so what is the value of L in this case? 1, right? So, in some sense, you see that 1 over L learning rate plays a key role, right? 1 over L is also 1. And you see that in one step you kind of converge, at least in this problem, in one step you converge to the optimal solution. No, yeah, it is not necessary that it will con converge in one step, that is that is true. So, that is that is why I said in this problem, at least we see that for L equal to 1, in one step we converge, right? So, in some sense it tells you that uh, it, it has this kind of optimality uh, or like optimal behavior when you choose the learning rate to be 1 over L. Okay, so that that is something that we are going to be uh, deriving today. All right, so let's start with today's lecture. So we looked at uh, ways to convert a primal optimization problem to a dual optimization problem, right? So let's look at few a simple example. So we consider a linear program, so dual of a linear program. Okay, and the problem is of the form minimize C transpose x subject to, so let me just minimize C transpose x, let us say x is in Rn subject to Ax less than equal to b, okay. And and why do we need to work with dual of like dual problem here? You can assume that A is a matrix from M cross N and you can assume that M is much much smaller than N, okay? So, how do we dualize this? Yeah. Yeah, element, yeah, row wise, 
okay. So, how do we dualize this? We define the Lagrange dual. So, we consider like in this case we have m inequality constraints. So, we are going to consider uh, lambda which is m dimensional and we are going to be defining this lambda as now it is going to be an unconstrained minimization over x basically f of x plus lambda transpose whatever inequality constraints you have right which is h x let us say you had the inequality constraints h x uh, less than equal to 0. So, in this case it turns out to be minimize c transpose x plus lambda transpose a x minus b ok. Now, what does this evaluate to? So, let me so we get minus lambda transpose b plus let us collect all terms uh, ok. Is this clear? So, g lambda by definition is going to be minus lambda transpose b if this term is 0 right. If this term is 0, if a transpose lambda plus c turns out to be 0, then it gets a value of minus uh, lambda transpose b. Otherwise, it can be negative infinity right. If this is not equal to 0, you can choose an x. If this is not equal to 0, let us say for one particular row, this value a transpose lambda plus c, I mean you can always choose x such that you can make things like negative infinity right. You can just just keep increasing your x and x to a point you choose a sign accordingly such that this particular element becomes negative infinity. So, else ok. So, suppose so, first of all is this problem uh, let, let us say suppose p star is finite or the primal optimal is finite. So, does the strong duality hold here or status condition does it hold here? So, for linear inequality constraints do we need strict infeasibility or strict feasibility? No right. So, it, these are linear inequality constraints. So, we do, uh, do not even need strict feasibility status condition hold I mean hold true by default. So, the, I mean if p star is finite I mean you in fact have linear function to start with which is convex right. So, you have the assumption star that we started with and p star is finite. So, you have strong duality here. So, that means this is not true. So, the corresponding dual problem is maximize minus lambda transpose b subject to you have constraint a transpose lambda plus c greater than 0 and lambda is greater than equal to 0 and this is your dual problem. This is a dual linear program. Is this clear? Ok. So, dual of an LP is also an LP like if you start if you start with linear program in primal variable you come up with a dual uh, dual optimization problem which is also an LP right. It is a linear program in lambda. So, dual of an LP is also an LP, but the good thing is if you I mean in earlier case we had started with inequality constraints for the dual problem we all we get the equality constraint plus lambda greater than equal to 0. So, I mean manageable inequality constraints, but then you get an corresponding equality constraint here. Right. So, that that is one advantage of working with the dual formulation of an LP ok. Yeah. Right. Yeah, because I mean let us say you are solving the primal right and if m is much much smaller than let us say you are using some kind of gradient descent or something and let us say m is much much smaller than n and n is very large let us say 100,000 dimensional. So, you are storing an x which is 100,000 dimensional and you are sort of like updating it every time right. So, that becomes uh, memory inefficient. Whereas, when you work with dual if lambda let us say m is much smaller let us say m is equal to 10 or m is equal to 20 you are now working with the much smaller m right. 
much smaller dimension like st storing smaller lambda is much easier than storing a larger x but now we have a lot of constraints not a lot of constraints we had like lot of constraints even earlier as well right x less than equal to here we have n inequality right Sure, but then these are equal. These are equality constraints. That I mean, that makes things easier, right? Like first of all, I mean, e equality constraints is something has to lie on the hyperplane, versus something that can be anywhere, like less than equal, like I mean, in the half space that is separated by that hyperplane, right? But would that be easier to optimize? Yeah, I mean, I mean, both are linear programs. In some sense, the difficulty at like at some level is kind of in terms of algorithmic from algorithmic <laughs> viewpoint. I think they are going to be similar. It's largely about like, are you going to be working with a n, an n-dimensional vector versus an m-dimensional vector, and that makes things much much more uh, efficient if you are going to be working with a smaller dimensional vector. And also think of it in terms of uh, again, I mean, like at the back of your mind, uh, keep the distributed optimization aspect. Like I mean, we are looking all of this because eventually we are going to be working with dual algorithms when we look at uh, distributed optimization problem. And if you're going to be exchanging information with your neighbors, you want to exchange vectors or information which are smaller dimensional than, uh, like higher dimensional, right, or larger dimensional. So it makes sense to work with dual, uh, dual optimization problem than primal ones. So yeah. Here we are obtaining the optimal solution in terms of lambdas. Yeah. What if we wanted the optimal solution? So then, I mean, so then there is this constraint which sort of uh, relates. I mean, in in case of uh, here, I mean, yeah. So that's a good question. In the earlier case, usually we, so you know the value of, for instance, once you get the G, like the optimal value, right, maximum value. So lambda star transpose B plus A transpose lambda star C plus X star, that would give you the, that would basically hold with the equality, right. And then you, that from there you can solve for X star. So eventually you need to find X and you can do it, I mean, once you have sort of, uh, again, uh, think of a distributed optimization setting, right. You work with lambdas and once you have your like a consensus on, on lambda among all the agents, then I mean they can simply sort of uh, get the original primal variable using this con like using this equality, right. So you are right, I mean this basically gives you the same optimal value, not the value of x star directly, but then you can solve for x star from here. Okay. Yeah, 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 right, yeah, yeah. So we are going to look at another uh, advantage of working with dual uh, dual problems, and this time through uh, the support vector machine. Okay, so dual of an SV. So does everyone remember what SVM is? Support vector machines. So let just to recall. So you have a bunch of uh, positively labeled and negatively labeled data points. Okay, and the goal is to find a separating hyperplane or a hyperplane. Let me use a different color. That separates these two sets of points, right? Uh, so let's let's say the labels for these points is plus one, and for these set of points it's minus one. So any point is represented by x i y i. So x i is a cord, like basically coordinate of that point, and y i is essentially the label of that point. So y i in this case is plus one. Okay. Now you want to find the hyperplane that maintains the maximum margin with respect to the positively and the negatively labeled data points, and margin is in some sense it's related to uh, how much you can perturb on either side before like you incorrectly sort of classify a particular point right and you want to maximize uh, this margin in some sense because there are multiple solutions that separate these two sets of points so which one do you choose you choose the one which maximizes this margin robustness margin okay and equation of this hyperplane was given by w transpose x plus b so and remember in this case the, in, uh, the decision variables are w and b not the x, x are the data points then y are, y's are the label, 
okay. And we derived the this particular optimization for the primal optimization problem and this was minimized with respect to W and B subject to let's say there are m points. So, this was the primal problem that we had derived uh, I think in the uh, few lectures back right. So, is everyone with me on this? All right. So, let us try and come up with the dual for this optimization problem ok. So, so first we define the Lagrangian like if we want to come up with the dual we need to define the Lag uh, Lagrangian dual for that right. So, that is going to be in terms of like because they are just the inequality constraints. So, we would be needing lambdas right and let us define g lambda to be So, w and b are the primal decision variables f of x which is half norm w square plus there are m inequality constraints because there are m points in the training set. So, we would have summation i equal 1 through m lambda i which is the ith coordinate. Is everyone with me on this? Yeah. Is this clear to everyone? So, f of x plus lambda transpose h of x in this case there are m inequality constraints. So, you have m I mean basically lambda is m dimensional. So, lambda i times this particular term is it ok right. So, now we need to minimize this is an unconstrained minimization with respect to w and b. So, how do we find the optimal w and b? Just take the derivative and set it to 0 because it is an unconstrained minimization. So, what is the minimum of uh, like when we try to minimize this with respect to w? What do we have? The derivative of the first term with respect to w is uh, is simply w, and the second term is minus summation i equal. So let's call it w star i equal one through m lambda i. Y i x i trans yeah. Okay. This is equal to zero. Is this clear? So it's W transpose W, right? Half of that. So it will be if you take the derivative with respect to W, it will be simply W. Is this clear? So that's the that is when you set the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to w and you set it to 0 that is what you get. But the other decision variable is what? b. So, we also need to set the derivative with respect to b and set it to 0. Uh, so, that means gradient with respect to b of this Lagrangian that also needs to be set to 0 and what does this give us? So, if you set the derivative with respect to b and uh, to 0 you get i equal 1 through m lambda i y i is equal to 0 ok. So, I have this constraint and this constraint and let us bake this constraint into the let us use this to evaluate g lambda ok because we are trying to minimize g lambda with respect to w and b. So, let us use this to minimize g lambda. So, what does this give us? g lambda is equal to now I am using minimum value of w star and b star. So, let us see. So, half of w transpose w right and w star by definition is this particular term. So, that basically tells gives us i equal 1 through m lambda i y i x i transpose I mean i is just a dummy variable. So, I can use j lambda j y j x j ok half w transpose w that is the first term 
Is this clear? Plus summation i equal 1 through m lambda i. That is the first term over here minus i 1 through m lambda i y i and we have w transpose x i here and I can again replace w write w in terms of uh, summation j 1 through m lambda j y j x j transpose x i ok w transpose x i is what I am writing and then you have minus b summation i equal 1 through m lambda i y i b i right or lam lambda i y i is this clear all good so everyone ok with this so I am just replacing the value of w star just writing it uh, just replacing it over here because I need to find the uh, optimal value of this particular term right this particular Lagrangian. So, I am just replacing uh, w star using this uh, this particular constraint. This is going to be 0 because we have just derived uh, this particular thing right. So, this term is going to be 0. What about these two terms? This is half of this term and it is minus 1 of the same term right ok. So, this means g lambda is simply summation i 1 through m lambda i minus half of summation i comma j 1 through m you get lambda i lambda j y i y j and you have x i transpose x j which I can write this as in a product between x i and x j. So, this is the def this is your g lambda ok and the dual problem is maximize g lambda lambda in R m subject to you have this constraint right summation i equal 1 through m lambda i y i equal to 0 and lambda a is greater than equal to 0 and this is your dual dual of S V m. Now, something interesting is what you notice over here and this also gives you an idea uh, as to why dual dualization of this particular problem is important. So, in this case here it is easier to find a uh, linear hyperplane that separates uh, these two sets of points, but what if what if the distribution of points is something like this. So, you have positively labeled points at the periphery and negatively labeled points like this. And the question is can you find a separating hyperplane that separates these two sets of points or I am sorry a linear separating hyperplane? No right. So, in fact, uh, in fact I mean it is in this case for instance it is impossible to separate these two set, set of sets of points in R2 or in this, but using kernel function you can sort of map this to an abstract higher higher, uh, higher dimensional space where these points become linearly separable right. And you can simply replace this by kernel of x i and x j. So, by choosing the appropriate kernel you can separate even non-linearly separable data points like this. So, you can use polynomial kernel, RBF kernel, Gaussian kernel and so on, but you can see then in the dual formulation you just replace this uh, in a product x i and x j with the kernel of x i and x j and then and then you are done, which is not possible by the way when you are doing uh, working with that primal formulation right. So, there is a direct advantage of working with the dual uh, version of the SVM because you can work with non linearly separable data points as well. And in fact, in your uh, in your assignment problem, I am going to give you uh, I am going to have you basically work with a nonlinear SVM. Essentially, use kernel to uh, be able to separate nonlinearly separable data points. Yeah, sometimes this uh, dual view of the primal form basically it helps you with lot of uh, such uh, 
important details. All right. Any questions on uh, dual formulation? So it can be like a polynomial, like depends depends on what kind of kernel you choose, right? So for instance, the so the idea behind kernel is for uh, let's let's consider a simple setting. I think it would be easier to understand through. Uh, so you have two dimensional uh, x1, x2. Let's say you have two dimensional, uh, like you are working in R2, and you have like a quarter of a circle, kind of this, and you have. another quarter think of it as if like this particular these particular set of points are distributed across a circle x1 square plus x2 square is equal to 4 and maybe this one is uh, x1 square plus x2 square is equal to 1 something like this right now it's difficult to find i mean and maybe if they are really far apart you can still find a linearly separable hyper like uh, sort of a linear separating hyperplane that separates these two set of points but the idea is uh, a better solution would be to find some, some which, uh, uh, well not a hyperplane but some like or a uh, non in a hyperplane which separates these two sets of points like this right yeah no solving this dual will give you uh, lambda right so from B. Uh, so, you can you can get W from here right w. and you know that if the problem is uh, so, so you know the value of G lambda right at optimal. So, how do you get the B? So, B would be yeah. So, we will we'll get to so, I, I have not covered something called KKT conditions which was which I was going to come to. So, we will we'll, we'll get to that point. So, as I was telling, uh, so you want to find this kind of hyperplane, right? And you see that it is not possible in the original access system. What I instead do is I define a new access system where instead of working with x1 and x2, I project this these set of points in a new uh, coordinate system where instead of working with x1 and x2, I have x1 square and x2 square. So, if x1 square and x2 square are my variables, these are nothing but equations of lines, right? So, these points are now going to be distributed like this. In a straight line. Okay, and now in this new coordinate system, I can find a linearly separate, like basically a hyperplane which uh, separates these two sets of points, a linear hyperplane, and then I sort of project this back to the original uh, coordinate system, and that's what kernel does. The kernel trick does. Okay, and so you are trying to, I mean, so that kernel kind of maps it to an abstract higher dimensional space where these data points become linearly separable. Okay. All right. 